have a seat. Well, I've been a pastor now for five years, and one of my uh, least favorite things that some pastors do is use uh, like churchy words uh, without giving definitions. So we have lots of words here in the church that we use. Um, and the one that I want to think about this morning during our confession of forgiveness is the word righteousness. It's a word that we use sometimes. We hear it a lot in church, but we don't oftentimes know what it means. And righteousness simply means being made right in relation to other things. So here's an example. If you were to break a bone and your bones are no longer lined up correctly, your leg bone is no longer lined up correctly, your leg is unrighteous. It is not in line in relationship to the other thing. And so what a doctor does then, it pulls your leg and sets it right so that it can be righteous. Your leg is now righteous. It's in line so it can heal correctly. I had a, uh, something like this happen to me this week. If you're squeamish, I apologize. I was re our bathroom, our shower and tub, and I was using um, a tool to cut open um, the, the tube of caulking, and uh, something happened. I'm a little bit embarrassed um, how it happened, but something happened, and uh, the tool that I was using uh, broke, and what happened, what ended up happening is a blade came down on my fingernail 
and cut right through my fingernail, split it in half and into my finger. And it was, it hurt, it was terrible. So I called to Sarah, uh, I, after the bleeding stopped, I wanted to um, super glue my nail back together, but I had to make sure that my nail was righteous, right? It was kind of all cockamamie, right? And I had to set my nail right so that my wife could put the super glue on it. And now my nail is super glued and it's healing correctly. Well, we are unrighteous. We are not in line with what God expects and what God wants from us. We are, we are out of whack. We are not in the right place. We are not lined up with God. And he gives us a way to make us righteous. And that way is confession and forgiveness. And he gives us a promise. He says, if you confess your sins, if you tell me what you've done wrong, if you, if you tell me what's weighing on your heart, I will set you right. I will make you righteous. Not because of any behavior, not because of any change that you made, simply because I love you. I will make you right. And then once you're right, you can heal and flourish the way you need to. He gives us a promise. Confess your sins and you are forgiven. And when we are forgiven, when we are free from our sins, we can flourish under God. We can experience the joy and the peace and the goodness and the blessings that he has for us. But we're unrighteous. And so we need to be made righteous. And when we tell God the things that are weighing on us, when we tell him of our sin, he makes us right. He lines us up so we can heal and we can flourish. So let us confess our sins this morning. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the scripture. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us confess our sins at this time. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news this morning. In the mercy of almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives you all of your sins. You are righteous. And to those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To the 
in our grief and brokenness you suffered by our side from a cradle to the cross rising up victorious the messiah jesus born to us on that holy morning scripture reading comes to us from the book of Matthew, the third chapter. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came out of the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, we welcome the children to come forward for a special children's sermon with our Director of Children's Ministry, Mrs. Lori Brogan.
everybody. I want to tell you about two different kinds of following in footsteps. There's the first kind where, let's see, Knox, stand up right here. Okay. Now walk that way. Okay. Now turn around and go back. Okay. Have a seat. <laughs> All right. So I just followed Knox. I was following in his footsteps, right? Okay. Now there's another way you can follow in someone's footsteps, and that is to try to be like them, to try to act like them or do something that they do. Like, for instance, um, if Miss Kinsley over here was to grow up and go to seminary and become a pastor, she would be acting like her dad, Pastor Ben. So people would say, Kinsley is following in her father's footsteps. You get it? Okay. Now, God wants us to follow in someone's footsteps. Do you know who? Jesus. Yeah, it's Jesus. God wants us to follow in Jesus' footsteps. See, Jesus, we all know, is the Son of God, right? And we know that he lived on this earth and walked here, right? And when he was here, Jesus was the true king of kings, okay? Jesus was God's son, but he never acted like a king. Jesus never put himself above anybody else. He never acted like he was better than anybody. If somebody called Jesus a name, Jesus didn't call them a name back. Jesus spoke kind words about everybody. And if somebody tried to hurt Jesus, Jesus didn't hurt them back. Jesus forgave them. And when John the Baptist was baptizing people in the Jordan River, who do you think showed up? Jesus. Jesus showed up. And John thought, this is the Son of God. He's come to baptize me. But no. Jesus wanted John to baptize him right along with everybody else there that day. Now, Jesus is not here on earth anymore, so we can't follow in his footsteps like I followed Knox around up here. But we can follow in his footsteps by learning all that we can learn about him. We've been learning about knowledge in Sunday school, how by studying scripture and learning the Bible, praying, coming to Sunday school, doing all of those things, we can learn more about Jesus so that we can act and be like him. We can follow in his footsteps. Let's pray. Lord God, help us every day to follow Jesus, to follow in his footsteps, to do the things you would like us to do, to be like him, to be true Christians. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. Okay. Well, as this pile of kids grabs all their treats and gets ready to sit down, I do want to draw your attention to the connection card, which is right in front of you in your pew. And so if you've been here for a while, you kind of know the drill. This is your chance to communicate with us before you forget, right? So if you have a, a prayer need or you want to know more about a ministry or you've recently moved, this is your chance. So members and regular tenders, uh, go ahead, fill it out during my sermon. I won't be offended. Get all that stuff updated so we can best communicate with you. Then you can drop it in the offering plate as it goes by. However, if you are a guest with us this morning, right, maybe you've been attending for a while covertly or this is your first time, I would love to get to meet you. And the best way to do that is to fill out that connection card. But I want you to do something a little bit different with it, okay? Everyone else will put it in the offering plate. I want you to keep hold of it in your hand. And then as you're walking out, go straight to the Welcome Center. And Pastor Eric will be back there today. He'd love to get to know you a little bit better. 
hand him the card, and he's going to hand you a, a wonderful New Life Tumblr filled with some information about our church so you can best get connected to our church family. And so please, please, please uh, do me that favor, fill out that card, and let us get you that gift because it is my great honor to say thank you for joining us in service this morning. And so please uh, take advantage of that. Well, I am Pastor Ben. It is my privilege to share God's word with you today as we launch into a new sermon series. But as we do, this is what I know about you. This is what I know about your family. You all have something that you do, some activity or some, some sort of, of element in your life that draws you together, that unifies you as a family, right? No matter what you're going through, if you take part in this activity, it brings you together as a family. Now, for some of you, you like the outdoors, and so traveling through God's creation, going on hikes, that's a thing that you enjoy doing together. It draws your family together, right? Going on little adventures, having conversations along the way, and it just unites you as a core group of family. Now, for some of you, you could go without the outdoors, but you do like sports, right? And so you have your favorite team, and so you love to wear the apparel, and you all have the jerseys, and every Saturday, every Sunday, you cheer on your team, right? You go through the highs and lows of it all, but you make it through no matter what, even if you're a Bears fan or yesterday a Vikings fan. It's just been a horrible, horrible, horrible last few weeks for all of us. But you make it through, right? You love your team, and that brings you together as a family. Maybe for you, it's cards, right? You love sitting around the table playing euchre or some card game like that, and you're competitive and you have fun, and sometimes you're angry, but sometimes you're filled with joy and you share the stories, and it brings you together as a family. For my family growing up, it was always movies, right? We loved movies. We loved going through the stories together. And so typically on Sunday nights, we would pop some popcorn, go downstairs, turn on the surround sound system, and we'd watch a movie together that we all would enjoy, and it would bring us together. And I have some of my greatest memories are watching movies with my family. So it should come as no surprise that now that I have my own family, right, have my own wife and, and my own kids, that I have infused this into our culture and in our family. And so we love just sitting down and watching movies together. But I do have a problem. See, my kids are two and one which means the movies that they enjoy are typically cartoons. And I can only stomach about one or two of those before I start losing my mind, right? But I have a, tr I have a problem, right? The, the problem is that if I watch the movies that I want to watch, there's going to be scenes and there's going to be words that they can't hear, right? And if I'm watching those movies, it makes me uncomfortable, right? It makes the, the hair on the back of my neck stand up because I'm like, oh, I don't want my son or my daughter to hear that word or see that scene. And so I'm caught in this conundrum, right? I don't want to watch cartoons all the time, but I have to be very careful about what we watch. And it's just really easy for me to, to violate that, right? It's, it's just really easy for people or my kids to see something that I don't want them to see. So my older brother, he would say he's the smartest of us three boys, but I, I will tell you right now, he was also the last one to get his master's, so you do with that what you want. But anyways, he came up with this great idea. Right? He, he would take the movies, he'd put them onto his computer, and then he'd actually take out all the words and all the scenes that he didn't think were fit for his family. Then he would edit it, put it back onto the disc, and they'd watch it together. Right? That's how he fixed this problem, so he could watch movies that he could stomach, but also it took out all those bad parts. Now, I've had my kids later in life, I'm younger than him, and so I've actually had some more uh, technological advances since then, and I can actually use things like an app. So I have an app that I use that I can actually click out all the things that I don't want to be in the movies, and it will just actually bypass all those things. It's great, right? I can watch all, all sorts of movies that I enjoy with my family and not feel concerned about it. However, over Christmas break, I had my sister-in-law come and visit our house, and she said, hey, I want to watch a movie. And I said, great. Just go on my TV, you can see all my movies, they're all on there, and go ahead and pick and watch whatever you want to watch. And then I went off to work at church. Well, when I came home, she was not very happy because my filter was still on. And she was trying to watch a movie, and it was taking out all the scenes and all the words and all these things that I didn't want my kids to watch, but she's a grown-up. And she said, I can't even understand what's happening in this movie, Right? All these words and all these scenes are gone, and I don't even know what I just watched. See, it was so filtered, she didn't even get the point of the story. And we all understand this, right? If you take out certain scenes and certain words out of a movie, it'll actually change the story of the movie. But far too often in our faith journey, far too often in churches, 
far too often from the pulpit, we do that exact same thing. We don't talk about certain sections of the Bible because they might be offensive. Or we change the storyline or we avoid certain stories because we don't want people to really know what's really in there because they might be offended. You see, I don't want this to be an issue in our church. I want you guys to know the real Jesus. You see, sometimes when we hear about Jesus like that, right, when we, when we interject Jesus into these stories or remove parts out of his story, all we're left with is a guy who is really nice and really kind and really loving, at least by our definition of love. But there's a problem with that. You see, a guy who was just loving, nice, and kind wouldn't have ended up on a cross because that's not the real Jesus. And I want you to know the real Jesus. So throughout this sermon series, that's exactly what we will be doing. We're going to be leaning into the scripture. We'll be learning into to real history about Jesus and learning about the very real and very unfiltered Jesus. And so today we're going to be continue our ser- we're going to start our sermon series in the book of Matthew and this is what we read. In those days John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea proclaiming So as we begin Christ's story, we actually start with another man's story. His name was John the Baptist. And we're going to see these two lives intersect. But as we begin, we see that John has an interesting title. It's John the Baptist, which doesn't mean that he was from the Baptist denomination, right? It doesn't mean that he's like John the Lutheran or John the Presbyterian or John the Catholic, right? The reason he's called John the Baptist is because this was the, the core of what he did in his ministry. He would baptize people. Now, what's so interesting about John is we see where he is baptizing people. It says he's out in the wilderness. Now, in that day, if you lived in the wilderness, it meant that you were poor, you were broken, you were sick, you were an outcast. Because to live in the city costs money, right? To live in a town costs money. In fact, if you had certain sicknesses and certain illnesses, they would banish you to the wilderness. So John actually sets up shop in the midst of the poor and the broken and the sick and the outcasts. And this is the message that he proclaims. Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Basically what he's saying is, get ready, the king is coming. Now, we live in America and we don't have a king and a queen and stuff like that. And the world has really changed since this point in time. But in this day, to say the kingdom is coming means the king is coming and you better figure out which team you are on. You better figure out which side that you are on. Because if the king shows up and you're not on the king's team, that means you are against the king. Right? If the king shows up and you aren't an ally, then you are an enemy of the king. So John says, get ready because you want to be on the right side of this story. Well, the writer continues. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke. When he said, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So the the writer of the story is a guy named Matthew. He was a a Jewish guy, a disciple of Christ. And so since he's speaking primarily to Jewish people, he uses the Hebrew Bible, he uses the Old Testament, and he uses the prophecies there to tell people that this story is true. To convince people that Christ's story and John's story is actually predicted and it is from God. And so he uses this amazing prediction by the prophet Isaiah, 700 years old, to show how God's design for humanity, God's predictions are lining up with what's actually happening in history. He said, look, John the Baptist is this voice crying out in the wilderness. A perfect prediction fulfilled in John the Baptist. Unbelievable. 700 years before this moment in time. Over twice the age of our nation. Unbelievable. Well, Matthew continues. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Now Matthew inputs this little detail into here because it is weird, right? It sounds weird to us, and it would sound weird to them. This would be just like you going to the mall, and some dude is walking around with a big cloak made out of camel's hair with a leather belt just snacking on honey and wild locusts, right? This, this is who this guy is, right? And so Matthew is telling us, John was kind of an oddball. Well, Matthew continues. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing 
their sins. Despite John being kind of an odd person, despite him being so eccentric, it drew people in, right? They wanted to hear. The word had gotten out. It wasn't just for the people in the wilderness. Now it's for the whole world, and people wanted to see what John was all about. And so people were coming from all over, all over. And what's so interesting is that the people who are coming were Jewish. You see, when we think of baptism, we think of baptism for everybody. But when a Jewish person, especially in that day, heard the term baptism, they thought of something specifically designed for Gentiles. You see, if you were a Gentile or a non-Jew and you wanted to step into the Jewish faith, you had to do two things. You had to be circumcised and you had to be baptized to wipe off and wash off all your Gentileness, right? This is what you do, and then you'd step into the Jewish faith. But John is doing something so interesting. He's inviting the Jewish people, not the Gentile people, the Jewish people, into baptism. This is absolutely scandalous. He's trying to get them ready for their king. And this is what happens. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. So the story gets out, right? People are coming from the city, and the religious leaders, which are the Pharisees and Sadducees, they want to see what this is all about. So they show up, right? Their curiosity gets the best of them. And they show up, and John calls them out because he knows that they are there, not with good intentions. He knows that they aren't there to get baptized because this is not how they function. Even though they had their own little nuances that separated them, the one thing that they did have in common was that they followed the law and they would isolate anybody out of their lives that didn't follow the law, right? The good people is who they would hang out with and everyone else was outside their box. They would not spend time with them. They would not spend time with a Gentile. And so to practice or do something that would connect them to Gentiles is not what they would do. It is not how they would behave. And so John calls them this horrible thing. He calls them a brood of vipers, right? He just attacks them. This is not nice, and this is not kind, but it is the truth. You see, John was speaking the truth out of love because he knew that they were not in a right relationship with God, and he wanted them to change. In fact, later on in the story, Christ would call them the exact same thing. Jesus would call the prophecies, or sorry, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he would call them a brood of vipers. Not nice, but loving, because he wanted them to understand the truth. Well, John continues, Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. So John keeps pressing in on them. He says, you believe that just because you are Jewish by genealogy, right, just because you have DNA of the Jewish lineage, that you will be saved. You see, he's attacking a lie that they had believed. He was attacking a lie that was prevalent in that culture. And actually, even today in some Christian churches, it's a lie that's been bought into. As if the Jewish people are saved just because they have enough or certain DNA amongst them, right? If you're a Jewish person by DNA, you are saved and everyone else has to figure out a different way. Everyone else needs Jesus, but Jewish people don't need Jesus because of their genealogy. As if God is some sort of cosmic racist up there trying to say, oh, you're saved because of who you came from. But John says, that's not true, right? That's not true. You are not saved that way. You're only saved through Christ. And John continues, even now the ax is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Man, he once again goes right at them. If you guys don't get this right, the ax is ready, you'll be cut down. What will happen? You'll get burned. He's talking about, specifically, he's talking about hell. Right? If you don't get this right, if you are not on the side of the king, if you're not in right relationship with God, this is the natural consequence of this behavior. This is the natural consequence of what will happen to you. And then John changes his focus to everyone else and he says these words. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. 
His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So John tells everybody about this king, about Jesus who is coming. He says, look, when he shows up, he's going to separate you into two groups. He's going to either baptize you with water to save you, or he's going to baptize you with fire to destroy you. And then he uses another analogy. He says, it's like he's a farmer, right? He harvests in the wheat. And the wheat he keeps, and the rest he burns up. Right? It's very, very clear what John is saying. There's two groups of people, those in relationship with Christ and, and those, those who are not. not. And, and both, both have different, different outcomes. Well, in the midst of him saying this, this is what happens next. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. So Jesus shows up in the story. He shows up amongst the crowd and all the people preparing to be baptized. And he comes to be baptized, which is so scandalous. Because he's the king. Right? The whole point of John's message is prepare yourself for the king. The king is coming and then the king shows up. And he wants to behave like everyone else. You see, this is odd and bizarre to associate with the weak and the lonely and the broken and the sinners and the diseased. Why would he do this? Apparently, John thinks the same thing because this is what he says. I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? In other words, Jesus, this doesn't make any sense. You're the king. You should be sitting on the throne. You shouldn't be down here in the dirty water with all these people. You shouldn't be associated with these people. You shouldn't link yourself to these people. But this is Christ's response. Let it be so now. For it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. And then he consented. You see, Jesus took his righteousness and he brought it into the water so we could find his righteousness in the water. This is unbelievably scandalous that the king would show up and associate with people who are broken and lowly, people who are like this. It almost begs the question, did Jesus make a mistake here? I mean, what is he doing? Maybe God has something to say. Maybe his father has something to say about this. And this is what he says. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. God looks down at his Son, looks down at this behavior, looks down at this moment and says, I approve. I approve of what he is doing. So I want to do something with you this morning before we close out. I want you to take yourself and put yourself in this moment of history, just like God put himself into this moment of history. I want you to imagine you were a, a good Jewish person living in Jerusalem, and you've heard the stories about John the Baptist. You've heard about he wears strange clothes and eats strange food, and he has, has this message, and people are out there being baptized, which is not something Jewish people do. You want to see it for yourself, right? You've heard the rumors, and now it's time to go. And so you make your way out to the Jordan River, the dirty Jordan River. And when you get there, there's unbelievable crowds. Thousands upon thousands of people are all out there to hear John's message. And you start looking around, you're scanning the crowd, and you start recognizing people, right? You have some friends and some family members. You have some neighbors. You look over and you see the religious elites, the Pharisees and Sadducees, these are people you've always looked up to, people that you've always wanted to have them look at you with favor. You see a bunch of people you've never seen before. It is a massive crowd after all. And you're standing there and you're listening to John preach. He's in the water and he's preaching and he's preaching and he's preaching. And the message is simple. And the message starts making sense to you. And you're starting to feel the stirring. And you're wondering, should you go? but you're intimidated by the crowd. I mean, you look, and, and what would my family members say? And, and what would my friends say? You look over at the religious leaders, and they're just shaking their heads, right? Their arms are crossed. They're not having it. Which means if you go down there, you know they're not going to approve of you. But you still feel that stirring. You feel like you should go. And just as you're about to take your first step, another young man steps up. A young man comes out of the crowd, and he walks forward. And he gets into the water, and him and John the Baptist are having this conversation. And you can just see John, he's getting very adamant. His hands are swinging, and his head is saying, no, 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 
You can't hear the words, but you can see it in his body language. And the other young man, which of course is Jesus, speaks to John. And finally John nods his head. And Christ is baptized. And he's pulled out of the water. And you don't quite understand it. You can't quite put your finger on it. But you know this moment is significant. You know this moment is special. And you take it all in. But then this man, this Jesus, he starts looking through the crowd. And he makes eye contact with you. And he looks right at you. And he beckons you over, right? He calls you over. He invites you into the water because that's what baptism is. It's an invitation into a relationship with Jesus. It's an invitation into his righteousness. But you're nervous. What will all these people think? But here's the thing. Following an unfiltered Jesus means following in his footsteps, which means walking up in front of a crowd, walking up in front of your friends and family and proclaiming that you want to be in relationship with your heavenly father, that you want to be in relationship with Jesus because that's what baptism is. It's an invitation into a right relationship with Jesus. So today, to follow Jesus, to stay in his footsteps, to keep walking in this path. It's time to take that step. Maybe for you, it's stepping out into your friends and family for the first time, and you're thinking, this is kind of awkward because I'm a grown-up, and, and isn't a lot of the people that get baptized kids? Yeah. Scripture says all. That means all. That's anyone of all ages. But what will people think? People wonder about me. They wonder what my story is. Well, they wonder what Christ's story was, too, when he walked forward. But when we walk forward to baptism, we enter into that relationship with Christ. And we experience that love of Christ. And then day after day after day, we remember that we are in Christ's family. We remember day after day after day who we are and whose we are. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for this scandalous story where you stood in front of all these people and you associated yourself with the sinful and the broken and the sick and the diseased and everyone stared at you and everyone wondered. Everyone wondered what was wrong with you. We also ask, Lord, that we take this truth, we put it into our lives and we live it out, Lord. Maybe that's a simple act of obedience, being baptized for the first time. Oh, Lord, maybe it's just a reconfiguration of our lives to remember to follow you in everything that you do, to remember our baptism every day of our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Lord, at this time, we just pray that you watch over those who are, are sick among us. We pray for Dave Allen and his heart for Jeanette George and her chemo treatments, for Sharon Turno and her chemo treatments, for Stacy Burge and her cancer, for Earl Ufkin and his heart, for Joe Siegel and his health, for Josiah Williams and his broken leg, for Beverly Oler and her health, for Lois Williamson and her pneumonia, for Mark Simpson and his medical issues, for Carl Baker and his morning sickness, for Teresa Devine and her health, for Tim Bell and his recovery after his stroke, for Rich Van Ostel and his lung problems, for Christy Lennox and her cancer, for Eileen Linton and her cancer, for Jackson Vandermoon and his lungs, for Logan and his mental health concerns as he's recently attempted suicide, for Haley Morton and her pneumonia, for Mike Ribble and his pancreatic cancer, for Earl Devers and his shoulder. Lord, we pray that you watch over all these people. Give them your healing. Let them know that they are cared for by you. May they find doctors who are given wisdom by you to best treat them and other medical professionals to help them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we also pray for the marriages in this room. We pray that you strengthen them. We also pray for the marriages upcoming of Garrett Scholl and Kate Sargent, Lord, as they look towards their wedding day. Lord, prepare them and strengthen them for this moment. We pray that every day after that they're strengthened and blessed by you, that they never give up, 
and they always move forward in their commitment to you and to themselves in their marriage. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we also pray for those who are recovering from surgery and looking towards surgery. Specifically, we pray for Marilyn Zitlow, who's looking towards surgery at the end of this month for her heart. Lord, we pray that you watch over her, steady the surgeon's hand, and we just hope that she has, hope that she has a great surgery and a great recovery. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, this time we also pray for all those who have lost loved ones recently, for the Harris family at the passing of Steve, for the Sula family at the passing of Ted, for the Anderson family at the passing of Megan, for the Zoller family at the passing of Robert, for the Gunderson family at the passing of Steve, for the Kilberg family at the passing of Craig, for the Lennox family at the passing of Ruth, for the Reppy family at the passing of Ron. Lord, for all these families, give them your peace, give them your comfort, May they trust in your promises that death is not the end, but it's just the beginning of a place where you have promised that there is no pain and there is no sorrow. And so, Lord, give them your peace and your comfort. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. At this time, we will be continuing our time of worship together by reciting our common faith using uh, the words of the Nicene Creed. And during this creed, uh, there are some more of those words that sometimes are we don't use in our day-to-day -day life. This is an old creed, an ancient creed that was originally written in Greek. And some of the words that we uh, use in this creed are uh, English words that are close to their Greek um, counterpart, and especially one line. Uh, during one of the lines, we say, One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. And what that's saying, the word Catholic is simply a word meaning universal. And the word apostolic means the, the same church that the apostles were, uh, the same gospel, the same uh, preaching that the apostles did. So when we use that phrase, one holy Catholic and apostolic church, um, we're saying that we believe in one church that is worldwide and is in fact historic. But the center of this creed is the person of Jesus Christ and his radical, um, uh, his radical salvation to us. Uh, coming to us in the form of a person, a human, um, as a baby, um, living the perfect life, being uh, killed for us, resurrected for us, and ascended for us, so we also may receive eternal life uh, with him. So, let us confess uh, our common faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we will be receiving Holy Communion. And you do not have to be a member here at New Life to receive communion. This is a time for believers to receive the benefits that are promised to us uh, through Christ's presence, through his body and blood in the bread and the wine. This morning we will be taking uh, communion by intinction, which means as you come down the center aisle, you will be handed uh, the bread, and you can take that bread and you can dip it into either the light-colored grape juice or the dark red wine. If you do require a gluten-free option, we have that available. Simply ask Pastor Ben or myself, and we'd be happy to turn the plate so you can uh, grab the gluten-free wafer with your own hand. We do welcome you all uh, to the table if you would like. Um, but if you do not wish to receive the elements, uh, you can let us know by crossing your arms in front of you like this. That will let us know that you do not wish to receive 
um, the bread and the wine, but instead we'll give you a blessing. And if you have children that are too young to receive, have them cross their arms in front of them. That way we know not to give them the elements, and we'd love to give them a blessing instead. This is what we hear in the Gospels. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. This time, let us pray together the way that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. At this time, as the table is prepared, I invite you uh, to take a moment of silence and prepare your heart to receive the sacrament. All things are ready. We invite the front rows to come forward. down from the broken sky traced out by the city lights my world from a mile high best seat in the house tonight touch down on the cold black top hold on for the sudden stop breathe in the familiar shock of confusion and chaos all those people going somewhere why have I never cared? Give me your eyes for just one second Give me your eyes so I can see Everything that I keep missing Give me your love for humanity Give me your arms for the broken hearted The ones that are far beyond my reach Give me your heart for the ones forgotten Give me your eyes so I can see Yeah He's 
buying time All those people going somewhere Why have I never cared? Give me your eyes for just one second Give me your eyes so I can see Everything that I keep missing Give me your love for humanity Give me your arms for the broken hearted The ones that are far beyond my reach Give me your heart for the ones forgotten Give me your eyes so I can see Yeah Just one second, give me your eyes so I can see everything that I keep missing. Give me your love for humanity, give me your arms for the broken hearted, the ones that are far beyond my reach. Give me your heart for the ones forgotten, give me your eyes so I can see. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Well, at this time, we're going to take this morning's offering, and I'm pretty sure I have this popping thing fixed now. So I apologize for that. Hopefully God's Holy Spirit was able to work through our technological difficulties this morning. But we're going to take this morning's offering, and this is a great time for us to give back from the abundance that God has given us. And for us as a church, it helps support our family. It helps support the ongoing ministries as we do earnestly strive to impact our community and our world for the glory of Christ, to bring his transformative power into every heart and life of all the people that God has entrusted us with. So we thank you so much for generously partnering with us. There's a lot of ways that you can join us in partnership. You can give via text or you can give online. You can also give by cash and check. That's what this time is for. And so if you are an online giver, just let the plate pass you by. Also, if you're a guest this morning, your presence is gift enough. We thank you so much for being here. We hope you had a great experience. So please also just let the plate pass you by. And I'm going to welcome them forward. And as they're coming forward, I'm going to tell you a few things about what's going on here at New Life. And so as you walked in, you probably got a bulletin. So you do have all that information in the palm of your hand, and hopefully you get a chance to look at all the ministries. But I do want to highlight just a few things. The first thing I want to highlight is something called our journey classes. And those actually start in a couple weeks on the 26th. And so the first two classes are specifically tailored for new members. Right, so if you are a guest, you're curious about New Life, there, there's no commitment required, but if you want to come to the classes, they're between services at, at 9.30, 9.45 in the, in the chapel over there. And so you show up a little bit earlier and you join us on the 26th, and you'll get to hear about the mission and vision of our church. You get to hear about our history, our strategy, all things that drive us as a church. It's also a great space to ask questions. All right, and so if you are curious, you've been attending for a while, you're thinking about dipping your toe in this membership idea, we welcome you forward to come on the 26th and we'll start that process. It's a great time. And so I encourage you to check us out and try that out and join us for the first journey class. 
Also, we have a great partnership with another local church called Harvest Time Bible, and it's down the way in Rock Falls. And so we throw a collective men's conference, and that's going to happen on February 1st. So if you are a man in the audience, this conversation is for you. Wives, go ahead and, and nudge. Girlfriends, go ahead and punch to the ear. I don't know, whatever you have to do to grab their attention. We're going to have a great time, and there's more information in the back, but there's no registration fee, and you can actually register that day, all right? So you don't have to sign up early. You don't have to pay anything. This is a gift to you to help you move forward uh, as a man, to move forward in your relationship with Christ. So that's going to be February 1st, and there'll be more information as the weeks go on. Now, this last announcement is really, really, really important, okay? So if you've not listened to anything I've said, this one you do want to know, you do want to write down because... If you screw this one up, you will look silly, okay? So write it down, get ready. Next week, we were going to do one collective service because it is our 10th anniversary as a church, okay? So next week, we will have one service, no Saturday service, no morning service, no second service. We're going to have one service at 10 in the morning, all right? 10 in the morning, 10 years. You got that, right? You're all locked in. You get that? So if you show up at 1045, you will be at the midway point of that service, okay? If you do that, still come on in, okay? It's okay. Don't feel bad. Come on in. Uh, but I don't want you to miss out. So 10 in the morning, come on in, find a seat with your church family so we can celebrate our 10 years. It's going to be a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful service. And here's maybe the best part. Afterwards, like any party, we got to eat. We got to celebrate, all right? So right after the service, we are going to provide a lunch for you free of charge. This is a gift to our, our people to celebrate what God has done here at New Life and what God continues to do at New Life. So right after the service, we're going to have Candlelight come in. They're going to cater our meal and take care of us. So make sure you mark that down. We're going to have a great morning together and then a great lunchtime together. Okay, so put that on your calendar because if you walk that door at 1045, you've already missed out on quite a bit. Okay, so make sure you have that written down. All right, it's time to let you go. It's time to send you back out into the snow and ice, all right? But I want to send you with a blessing. And this blessing is really ancient, and it has so much beauty and so much richness to it. It came from all the way from the Jewish priest to the people, and now in the Christian church, we offer it to the people who come and hear God's word as well. So receive this blessing before you head out on your way and let God guide you every step of the way. And as he does... May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. I will see you guys next week at 10 in the morning. Very good. See you guys next week. I've been asleep, head in the sand, watching the time just ticking. Clock runs around, days in and out, can't really call it living. Somewhere I let light go dark. But here's where my new story starts. Take my life and live.